Um, okay, hi everyone. Before we get started, uh, just a reminder that I'd like to let you know that this event will be recorded and posted publicly publicly to YouTube. If you do not feel comfortable being recorded, please take this moment before we hit record and spoiler alert, it's already recording, um, to uh, change your name as it appears on Zoom or turn off your camera. And in fact, uh, we recommend for the evening just to keep your cameras off for the for the guests, um, the audience who are joining us, because that way it works out a little bit better when our students are in conversation with the um, with our respondents. So go ahead and, and take a moment to do that and definitely keep your uh, microphones off, please. At the end, I'll invite everybody to for a resounding round of applause for our seniors and to turn cameras back on. Okay, so welcome. Uh, after all that, getting through all that, um, this is the fourth installment of the spring 2021. Um, that's not true. It's fall 2021, BFA Senior Thesis Conversations. Uh, my name is Aspen Mays and I'm the Chair of Photography and Faculty here at the California College of the Arts. And before we begin tonight's program, I wanna say uh, it's my great pleasure and privilege to celebrate our students tonight and all the inspiring work that they've made during their time here and their extraordinary uh, resilience in completing their degrees during a global pandemic. It's really been remarkable to work with these, with these students and just um, witness the work that they've made and it's been so inspiring. I know I speak on behalf of the faculty to have the opportunity to learn from them in this time of um, incredible, uh, incredible challenge. So I'm really thrilled and delighted that we get to celebrate you tonight. I also wanna begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, the California College of the Arts campuses are located in Weichin and Yalamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco respectively, on the unceded territories of Chochenyo and the Ramatush Ohlone people peoples, excuse me, we have who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present and future here and around the world. And we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. If you are unsure of whose land you are currently residing upon, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. And I can put that in the chat in just a moment. Um, so I'll say a little bit now about the, the format of this evening's uh, conversation. We're gonna be celebrating two photography seniors, Benjamin Bellamasina, Got it, Ben, and Stephanie Hall, and one indie senior, Joseph Hurtado. Each of the three seniors will give a 10 minute presentation introducing their work. After each presentation, our respondents, who I'll introduce in just a moment, will have a 10 minute conversation with the students, providing feedback and asking them questions. Please note everyone, uh, we won't have time during this event for a public Q and A, but we encourage attendees to put comments in the chat and affirmations for the seniors in the Zoom chat. The chat transcript will be saved at the end of this event and will be sent to the seniors as a form, as a sort of uh, virtual guest book. Um, and I just have to say from, from doing these the last two years, that part's really meaningful and touching. So please feel free to leave comments as we go for the seniors and know that they absolutely will get a chance to review them. Um, okay, and last but not least, as I mentioned, please remember to keep yourselves muted during the program. And I, like I said, I'll, I'll invite you all at the end to offer a round of, of applause. And now, without further ado, I'm gonna actually introduce our respondents this evening and just also acknowledge our CCA photography faculty joining us. I know I saw Nelson there in the chat and Sine Woods, um, Nelson Chan. So, um, and I know I see some other CCA faculty sort of sprinkled in the mix here too. And I just wanna welcome you all and thank you so much for supporting our program and joining us tonight. Um, and our two, um, what we call outside respondents, uh, are, are folks that we're so pleased to welcome and, uh, and have the opportunity for our students to learn from folks who are professionals in the field. So tonight we'll be joined by Christine Robinson, who is an art historian, curator, writer, and educator based in the Bay Area. She is currently a PhD candidate in art history at the University of California, Los Angeles. She has previously held curatorial and research positions at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, MOCA, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, also known as LACMA. In 2020, she curated the exhibition, Sarah Charlesworth, Image Language, A Printed Matter in New York, 
with, and by the way, I'll just, as a shout out, um, there's a great recording of that event um, online if you're a Sarah Charlesworth fan, as I am. Really appreciated listening to that. And I also would like to welcome Corey Keller, who has been teaching a senior project section at CCA this semester. And we're so fortunate to have Corey joining us on the faculty. She's a curator and led in this position for 18 years at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where she organized a number of major exhibitions, including a personal favorite of mine that I teach with all the time, Brought to Light, Photography in the Invisible, 1840 to 1900, which explored the use of photography in 19th century science. And she was also awarded a prestigious Lucy Award this year for Photography Exhibition of the Year, Dawood Bay, an American project. So that's, yeah, I can see some silent applause for you. Um, it was really, it was an awesome show. Hopefully a lot of you got a chance to see it, pandemic and all. And without further ado, the main event this evening, uh, what you've all come for to hear from our incredible students. So Ben, this is your moment. Um, you're gonna be great. And if you could go ahead and queue up your presentation and start whenever you're ready. All right, so hi everyone um, and thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Ben Bell Messina and today I'll be talking to you about who I am, some of my influences and inspirations, um, some of my older work and then finally my thesis work. Um, so, again, my name is Ben Bell Messina. I'm currently based in Cache Valley, California, where I've lived since I was six years old. Um, some of my interests include video games, gardening, biology and natural history, science fiction, technology, and transportation. Um, so, some of my earliest experiences with art were when I was three or so years old. Um, I would sit at the kitchen table with my sister and paint. Um, and I would often ask my mom to like draw random things for me, oftentimes like trains or cars or people. Um, and as a three-year-old, I thought that like she was the best artist ever and she could draw anything. Um, and I wanted to draw just like her someday. Um, so, you know, like drawing and photography are really different. So I just want to take a second to like, you know, um, address three-year-old me because he was pretty headstrong and I'm not sure he would like the decision to switch to photography, but here we are. Um, so photography is very like focusing, pun intended, um, and therapeutic for me. Uh, it allows me to express um, and dismantle my thoughts and feelings in ways that were impossible if I limited myself to the written word alone. Um, and I believe that every pho or photograph I take has the potential to reveal like a hidden mental state, otherwise hidden. Um, so other than my mom, my, the best artist ever, my interest in photography was sparked by a professor I had in community college, Nicole White, um, who is actually here today. Thank you for coming, Nicole. Um, Nicole had just inherited an entire photography program at DVC and was always extremely busy trying to make sense of another photographer's way of making in an unfamiliar space, as well as teaching classes and creating new curriculum. But she always found time for me or to have a conversation with me. Sometimes those conversations were about photography and others they were just about life events and experiences. Nicole was always supportive of whatever weird experiment I wanted to try, no matter how poorly thought out it was. Um, and through my time at DVC, Nicole helped me understand my relationship to photography as a means of documenting and observing my surroundings. So some current artistic inspirations that I have um, include Penelope Umbrico, whose um, series Suns from Sunsets from Flickr influences the way that I'll be presenting my thesis work when it's um, hung in a gallery space. Um, Ruben Wu, who has a really awesome like minimalist sci-fi aesthetic that I can't stop thinking about. Um, Daniel Shea, who combines beautiful photographs, um, mostly architectural, to create stories about place while simultaneously pushing the limits of photography. And Vivian Meyer, who um, the more I see her photography, the more I sort of identify with the, I guess like the like lone photographer narrative that's kind of like sprung up around her. Um, in addition, I've also been revisiting some video games, um, mainly in the Nier series uh, created by Yoko Taro. Um, Taro has a fascination with human behavior and his games ask a lot of like deep philosophical questions about, you know, humanity and finding meaning in meaningless situations, um, as well as pushing the boundaries of like video games as a medium. And actually, um, this is kind of unrelated to why I decided to go back to this, but this game has one of my favorite quotes of all time in it. Um, and it's kind of like my philosophy for a lot of the art that I make now. Um, and that quote is, rules do not exist to bind you, they exist so that you may know what your freedoms. Um, and so when, as we go through my, or like my art, like I'll kind of explain this a little more. Um, so first up is a series that I've entitled Ikea. 
Um, Ikea was the first time that I placed constraints and rules on the way that I photographed. Um, I have come to calling the set of rules for each project that I conceive as a process, as a or sort of continuation of the photographic process. Um, the way that I photograph, um, the way that I photograph like um, changes a lot depending on like the camera that I use. And these constraints help me understand the best way to use like the camera and the best way to sort of deal with the setting that I'm in. So Ikea is a series of four by five images taken within an Ikea furniture store. Um, and I created it shortly after I came out as gay. So Ikea is an attempt at um, describing the feelings of conforming out of fear and for the sake of appearances. Um, the goal was to use um, languages of consumerism to create a feeling of otherness and sort of like fakeness. And so by posing as if I was living within the displays, the images feel or mere experience or feelings and experiences or that I was experiencing before coming out. Um, and the displays like infested with tags, um, like investigate notions of keeping up appearances with tangible and intangible costs. Um, so some more work that I'm proud of um, is the San Francisco aesthetic reconstruction. Um, I really enjoy sort of like experimenting with photography um, in a medium where everything is real. I'm interested in how color, light and shape can create an emotional impact outside of the limits of representation. Um, in the same mode of creating constraints for myself, I created SFAR. So in this series, I use various light bending objects to create compositions that are psychedelic, graphic, and disorienting, um, and um, sort of use those like overwhelming features to sort of question like the, the sort of like economic understanding of San Francisco, particularly surrounding the notion of affordable housing and office space by sort of photographing buildings as these large expanses, lar far larger than like buildings could be, um, as sort of a way to sort of think about what having enough space for everybody would look like. Um, and you know, this this kind of just came out of like a, a desire to just sort of like photograph random things. Um, I really just enjoy um, sort of things that are not necessarily representational. Um, and so finally, um, my thesis work uh, is titled Stasis and is a collection of images of planes in flight. Um, I was really interested in sort of like freezing the motion of or like planes, something that sort of like we understand as like always progressing, it's never frozen. So the sort of notion of like freezing something like this was very important to me. Um, so my interest in planes, um, photographing planes in this manner started like a few years ago, but this project really took shape during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and because of the shelter in place orders enacted during the early days of the pandemic, I was overcome with feelings of loneliness and isolation. Um, and one of the ways that I tried to cope with my emotions was to spend as much time as possible outside. Um, and because this habit sort of like coincided with the decline and then resurgence of air travel, I began to notice more and more planes flying throughout the sky. Um, and sort of like the this like act of photographing planes um, gave me like an incredible sense of comfort and purpose, despite the fact that it like didn't really do much like to change my situation or alleviate my emotions like it. It, I don't know, it gave me some sort of like purpose and meaning in that. Um, and so somewhere along the way, like photographing these planes kind of became like a daily practice um, and the reflex to photograph planes has become so strong that like I'll like be browsing someone else's photos and I'll see a plane flying in the background and my first instinct is like grab my phone and take a photo. Like that's sort of like how strong I like, I've trained myself to follow these rules. Um, so stasis exists in two separate but equally complete forms, in my opinion. Um, the first is simply an album in Google Photos titled Planes um, that at the time of writing contains 704 images. It's already more <laughs> since I wrote this script. Um, this is sort of like considered an ever evolving collection of, um, of evidence essentially for this practice. Um, and I think of this album as like a digital trap tapestry that increases in length every single time that I take a photograph in this manner. Um, and the second form of stasis is as physical objects. So this sort of form includes um, 256 four by six light jet prints and a five by 26 foot cyanotype. Um, while the versatility of digital viewing is a boon in our isolated world, it's kind of hard to get a scale of what or like when every image is constrained by the limits of the screen. Um, and this presentation allows viewers to get a sense of the scale of the number of images I'm taking. Um, and then we have the cyanotype, which echoes the color of the original subject matter, the blue and the white, 
Um, and the process echoes the method of sort of like the environment which in which I'm photographing. So because the cyanotype process requires UV light, um, it requires me to be like outside in the sunlight, which is where this process first began. Um, and this thing was kind of a huge production to make um, because trying to lay out a 26 foot object to be like flat and level is like really hard. Um, so after I graduate, I'm really hoping to sort of like find a, like some sort of employment where I can employ my skills that I've learned at CCA. Um, and I also want to take some time to like travel and explore um, just because being stuck at home for the past years made me like really restless. Um, but I will be continuing to photograph both planes and um, I have another series where I photograph like masks that have been discarded on the ground. So I'll be continuing to do those. Um, and with that, we've reached the end of this presentation. So I, again, want to thank my friends and family for taking the time to talk or listen to me talk about my work. Um, and if you want to keep in touch with me after I graduate, some ways to find me are listed on the screen now. Um, thank you and have a good night. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ben. That was awesome. Um, it was so great to see that giant cyanotype. I think I speak for everyone. We were all like, whoa, that's amazing that the, that happened in there. I was also, I also loved what you said about it kind of can, can, um, existing in a complete set in, in your Google folder of, of images. That's, that was really interesting. Um, it's, it's just been such a pleasure to work with you and to hear you narrate this arc of your experience was really powerful. I definitely remember when you transferred in and started out in my class. And Nicole, also welcome. It's so great that, that you're here as well. Um, and really great to see that imprint that you made. Um, so we'll just kick it off and I'll stop talking. Um, Corey, I'll just invite you to um, to kick us off, if you don't mind. No, not at all, but you're gonna have to shut me up because I have a lot, I made a lot of notes while you were talking, Ben, so you may have to cut me off. First, I Ben, I really wanna congratulate you and everyone, but on uh, I, I know how hard you all have been working during this time and what a rough go this has been. And um, it's so, it's so rewarding to see what everyone has been able to achieve under such really um, unfortunate and difficult circumstances. So you should be really proud of yourself. I hope I hope you are. Um, I had a couple of thoughts. One was looking at you know Penelope Umbrico is a huge favorite of mine too. And at SF MoMA we acquired um, one of those the sunsets from Flickr piece, but it's installed differently than the one you showed in your slide. The one we had was um, taped to the wall, like with tape. And then at the end, we just literally like ripped the whole thing off the wall and destroyed the prints. And then Penelope always wanted us to send her a bag of the mangled taped up prints back to her as part, that was sort of part of the process. So I would just encourage you to think in your, your, your presentation is beautiful, but to think about what it means to install prints in that way and how you affix them to the wall. And is it meant to be, I mean, for Penelope, it's very funny because the slide you showed, I'm like, oh, that's very pristine for her work. Um, and she, when she, we would just like, we put as many pictures as we could get on the wall and that's how many pictures were in the piece. So that's just something to, when you install like that to think about, you know, how you want it to come back off the wall. Do you want it to come back off the wall? <laughs> it's an interesting, you know, you might not. Um, it's a really interesting question. Have you thought about that at all? Well, um, from my research on Penelope and Brico and in the series in particular, it seems like the presentation outside of the like, sort of like, grid with no space of four by sixes um, isn't important. So every single like sort of instance of this installation that I've seen, like it's all different sizes, different amounts of photos, different, um, you know, it's, it, the scale is just completely different. So um, I was kind of thinking of it from the perspective of the sort of like scale of the subject matter rather than like the sort of presentation or the like preciousness of the presentation itself. Yeah. No, that makes yeah. total sense. The other thing that I was thinking about with your IKEA series, which made me think, and I don't know if you've ever looked at really early Andreas Gursky, um, because of course your interest in the um, the rules uh, and the sort of set of prescription makes me think of Dusseldorf School photographers, but he particularly did a series that I loved very early of security guards sitting at their desks. It was a very early series that made me um, think about your Ikea work and um, I actually like your Ikea work better, but um, it's, <laughs> um, 
and I just was really intrigued by that. And I, while you were talking, I was digging behind me for this book, which I love, 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 um, called Draw With Your Eyes Closed. I guess it's backwards to all of you. Never mind. Uh, the Art of the Art Assignment. Um, and it's this wonderful book of different artists, art assignments that they give to their students. But these creative ways of taking rules and applying them to your practice as a spur to creativity, I think is one of the most wonderful ideas. So I really would encourage you to continue with that if that's something that makes you want to make work. Um, I did a little show during the pandemic and it was all about the local artists who were working within constraints and how um, you know within those limitations you can make some incredible work. And your professor Nicole White is uh, showed some pretty amazing work during that time working with toilet paper. So um, I think that that idea of the restriction as a as a form of freedom is a really interesting one. Anyway, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I would have loved to have been witness to the making of that giant cyanotype. Um, I hope someone filmed it. Did someone film it? Um, I did take pictures, but okay. no filming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Christine wants to go. You can yeah. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work. I'm really honored to be here and um, have the opportunity to see all of your accomplishments, all of your accomplishments this year. And um, yeah, I was just really... Uh, it, right away, I was thinking a lot about, you know, your use of rules and constraints and kind of creating these parameters on your projects. And I, I immediately thought of, you know, kind of early conceptual art and thinking of Joseph Kosuth and Douglas Kubler and, and this kind of move into um, photography and rules. And I, I love that um, you're kind of setting these things up as you move within them to kind of give yourself a a, a different kind of freedom within, you know, those restraints. And I was struck with by the IKEA series because, in in a way, um, seeing you in that space, it was really a kind of non-site in a way. It could be anywhere. It's the site you were saying of consumerism and this kind of, um, you know, this kind of notion of uh, home that's not home, but it could be, you know, in any country, anywhere in the world. And then moving into your San Francisco project about something that's so specific um, to the place where you live and to location. And um, I really liked how you navigated kind of different ideas of space and site. And as you moved, you know, as your work evolved into your thesis project, um, this idea that you were talking about in terms of movement um, really came through to me in a few different ways. I was thinking about um, the grid that you made later that um, almost looked like a kind of, it reminded me a little bit of a video game actually, how you could kind of move through, you know, these different trajectories across the space and um, that there wasn't, you know, really one way to look at it, that you could kind of be in front of that and, um, have different experiences every time, or each person could have a different experience. And then I also thought about movement in your cyanotype piece um, within the material itself, you know, that there's this kind of rippling, kind of like water, and it um, it seemed to kind of push that idea of movement forward for me. And also this idea of, you mentioned something earlier about mirroring, you know, I think back in the Ikea piece, but like I was thinking about the cyanotype piece is kind of mirroring the sky above, you know, that the way you had it on, on the ground, um, I was thinking of location on the ground and uh, mirroring what's above and what's below. But I have a question for you about that piece because um, so the photos that we saw of the cyanotype were kind of process photos, is that right? Um, or is was that the kind of installation or ha what would the presentation look like? So ideally the presentation would be on a wall. Um, unfortunately, my where I live doesn't have a 26 foot wall to hang the cyanotype. Um, so I thought that in order to sort of get an idea of the full scale of it, it would be better to just place it on the ground inside or like in my backyard and take a photo there rather than um, like fold it up <laughs> and try to take a photo of it. Um, but I, I, I'm actually really interested in like your response to that, like the sort of mirroring the sky, but putting it on the ground. Like that's a very interesting interpretation of that. 
Well, it, it really came through because, you know, in your presentation and how it unfolded, you're, you're showing these, you know, images of the sky. And then all of a sudden we're seeing the images of the sky kind of reversed. So um, I, I thought it was really great. Congratulations. The work's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask just a process question? What did you actually use for the negative for that thing? I didn't under, yeah. Yeah, so um, in DFAS, we actually have this material called Max Black, um, which is essentially like a clear acetate that we can put through our inkjet printers. So um, I had to make three separate negatives because um, maximum length is only 90 inches. Um, mm -hmm. But you essentially take those and then align them on the fabric. And then we had to like quickly like maneuver the entire fabric outside <laughs> in order to expose it. And what was the exposure length? Like how long? Um, the exposure length was... I think like 15 minutes or less. Like it was very short considering that I did it in like late October. Um, I was expecting it to be much longer, but for some reason it was only like 15 minutes. I'm so interested in how many students right now are working or looking at cyanotypes as a process. Again, I'm working on a project about Anna Atkins. So I'm all the way back the 19th Ooh, okay. century, but it's a really fascinating um, if you if you have a chance to go into San Francisco, uh, Megan Riepenhoff has a new show that just opened at Haynes Gallery of her cyanotypes. I think you might you might enjoy it just to, to see another artist working in a similar medium. But thank you. That looks like and you didn't have to put glass or anything anything on top of it. To... Um, so the first I actually made two of them. The first time it didn't come out, um, and um, Brianna, the photography lab manager, suggested that it's because the negative wasn't laying flat enough on the fabric. Um, so for the second time, we found like it's something we use for gardening, I guess. It's like a fiberglass sheet that is like semi-transparent. So it lets in some light, but not all light. And that was heavy enough to like press the negative down onto the fabric well enough to get an exposure. It's a big undertaking. It's interesting. I was thinking about um, also like Rauschenberg's tire tracks. I mean, there's like this. <laughs> and I was thinking about depending on where you hung that piece on the wall, you could achieve really interesting effects. Like if it went at that, like it was that center line of the wall, or if you hung it up at the top, you know, you would, or at the bottom, I mean, you could do it. It would be interesting to think about the position on the wall and how that looks. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, but I'm going to actually, we're going to wrap uh, up, but I'm, and I'm going to offer Nelson a chance to uh, give us a final thought, but I just want to compliment you so much on your curiosity. That was, that's always been a standout about working with you is your deep curiosity. And I love the, the way that you're thinking about works that sort of don't have a beginning and an end and exist in the flow of time and in your life. Um, so it's just been such a pleasure to work with you and I'm gonna let Nelson have any kind of final thought and then we'll get, Stephanie, we'll get ready for yours, okay? Yeah, Ben, it was really great to see all of the work. Um, I've had such a great pleasure to, to work with you and, and it's interesting, the first interaction we ever had besides sort of in the hallways when I first moved out here um, to teach at CCA was uh, when I was in your junior review and <laughs> I remember you were making the projection work and really kind of making a connection with those slides of your mother's and it was so good. Um, but then I asked you like, well, what else are you going to do? <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm really, really um, happy to see all of this other work that you've been able to make and um, especially through such a weird time that we're in, you know, the plain it's interesting that you know the the pictures of the planes even though you're looking up photography can you know is, is very much a walking medium right so as long as you have some good shoes on you can photograph and exercise at the same time and the amazing thing is you're you know you're you're looking up the whole time and it's sort of meditated and that's in that in that way so i love that daily practice um i do want to see the um the the SF acidic work sort of get pushed a bit more. You know, I think that um, because we live in a, a a place that is so complex, right? I wanna see where you actually push that conceptually because I do think that um, you being from here, making making that work is 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 really important, you know, and you have such a a wonderful perspective on how to sort of comment on what's happening in the city, you know? Um, 
Yeah. So yeah, congratulations. This was like really great to see. Uh, I can't wait to see um, what it all looks like in person. Awesome. Thank you so much. So again, uh, audience, keep the love coming in the chat or any questions that you have for Ben that you want to make sure he sees later. And without further ado, Stephanie Hall will be our next presenter. And you can go ahead and share your screen and start whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, do you see it or? Sorry. Um, can you, isn't that showing? Uh, it says you've started screen sharing, but I don't see the presentation. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. Don't worry. For some reason it's not. Uh, don't worry, just you know we've all we've all experienced the <laughs> zoom the agony and the ecstasy of zoom okay um sorry i don't know why it's I'm trying to figure out why it's not being. Yeah, it worked during tech check. Yeah, I mean, okay, I think I got it now. Yeah, let's try it again. I just had too much open. <laughs> We're all guilty of that. Where I am. Good thing you can't see my desktop. Okay, you see it now, right? Yes, you're good to go. Cool. So, um, my name is Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie Hall. Um, I like to introduce myself as Stephanie Dolores Rose. Dolores Rose is my middle name. Um, it's still me. Um, it's, I have two middle names, so I like to, I don't know, I, I feel like I've, I resonate more with my, my middle name. Um, and I take um, photos with my Olga. Um, so I'm so sorry to do this. I hate to interrupt you. We're seeing a screen view where we can, is everyone else seeing this too? There's like a, there's some kind of boxes and panels covering up your presentation. Really? How that happened. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I know we've all, don't worry. I mean, anything that can happen on Zoom has happened, I feel, in the last two years. Um, I'm wondering if you want to take a moment and maybe we should uh, see if Joseph wants to go next and while well, you can kind of troubleshoot on your end. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Well, that, I think maybe that might work a little bit better. There's something going on with some windows there that's showing all of that when you screen share. Um, Joseph, would you be amenable to that slight shift in plans? Yeah, that's cool for sure. Great, thank you. So everyone, I'm pleased to introduce Joseph Hurtado. Take it away. So let me say thank you for being the host, Aspen Mays. And of course, thank you all for attending, <laughs> all right? Um, good, so let's get this thing going. All right, I'm Joseph Rutado. Uh, this presentation is titled Trust and Struggle. Displacement and loss were what became the beginning of my past, surfacing first as poetry during my long moments of isolation on the streets of Hollywood, where I was born. The poetry I would write was done without the knowledge of the words I would use. The sense of loss behind the displacement found the words I didn't understand. For all my efforts to change this way of creating it has remained deeply rooted, uh, too far to reach and modify by my acquired education and experience. It remains like fragments coming together by their own will, and my job has been to bring clarity and coherence to the work. Through poetic meditations and ruminations, the collection of work I've put together is a representation of these lived terms that continues to bear witness continues to speak. Grappling with every aspect of it, the fragments came together but continue to be unresolved, thus culminating into this moment that I've been taught to confront, not the physical representation of the project itself, but the risk involved 
in my attempts of conceptualizing into real terms an experience as messy and violent as this. I was born in Hollywood, California, a first generation Hispanic growing up in a city that introduced me to every walk of life that I later recognized in every city. These stories have found their way into my work to unwittingly capture the quiet expression that goes unseen. As a multidisciplinary artist, currently based in Oakland, I began as a photography major at SFAI to learn about conceptual art. With my transfer to CCA, I was given the opportunity to be enrolled in this individualized program, which has allowed me to further explore these living past experiences. During my time here, I've struggled to bring this project into being and to complete my BFA is to realize and reconcile this project and these experiences. Delving deeper taught me how to approach each city on its own terms. It has allowed me to understand the language of their stories and retell them through my own body of work, be it through lamplight words, paint strokes of abstraction, or the urban landscape in my photographic images. This current series is the developing relationship that goes hard with the strong and stark presence of isolation, turning archives into a playful silence. Yet I continue to grapple with things like identity, poverty, homelessness, education, and violence, which had never allowed me to have the privilege of thinking in abstract terms. There was no room for books or discussions of them, even less for conversations that dealt with anything outside the basic survival, such as where will we sleep? Can we afford the groceries today? I lived in a place of immediacy with the mindset of life not extending past today. Insecurity of being a first generation Hispanic in a system that found humor and embarrassment to be near me and my awkward inability to be what was more familiar and praised than I could be. This is what informed my reality that I would later take on as a challenge to win small victories against authority. But what I couldn't and still deal with is the shame of this past. Since then, I've matured into something more of a person who can live beyond the daily crutch of whether or not the electricity is gonna get shut off or if I can afford the rent this month. Even though I've developed new tools to overcome the inequalities, the language barriers, cultural differences, I remain with certain challenges. In this instance is the conceptual work I've put together. Speak your truth, said Arlene Correa Valencia in a talk about her undocumented status. And it struck me as being a simple and obvious statement, but what made it powerful for me was how much this truth she lived by had put herself and her family in jeopardy. So when I decided to apply it into my work, it took on a fight and acknowledgement that I hadn't been ready to discuss in an open arena. Vulnerable is a word said to be overused and telling a very little, but in this instance, I feel it to be the knife that cuts open the body to reveal its history and impact of its environment where the organs of poverty are more damaged than that of a person of means in a very real way. Vulnerable then for me, is coming to terms with the persona I created to protect me from the judgment and ridicule. So inspiration born of displacement and poverty can begin like this, can look like this. The narrow corridors of inward folding boulevards, the dark soft romance of loneliness pushing effort into the city's abstraction and dim color and signage. My memories and all the provoking scenes live on billboards along the rootless boulevard and transient town freeways soliciting for another car ride, for another motel, another home of which became an empty gallery of bare walls exhibiting the only mainstay, a pillow, its blanket and disparaging voice, unknown yet all too familiar. These are the truths that remain with me. Now, I'd like to introduce you to a new work titled Speak Your Truth. Poem is titled I Dreamt I Was a Poet. 
I dreamt I was a poet, un poeta, surviving in the hands of brujas, living in the back of a botanica in Reseda with scorned lovers, lonely and bitter, candles scrawled in tension on their unglassed bodies, rituals of black magic mass. I dreamt I was a poet, un poeta, on the sidewalk and rooftop stage, walking its narrowing ledges, ledges of poverty, seeking the myth of escape, my jeweled eyes to suffer romance, to be without you, in the empty city, the language I was born to you, a home I was born without, mesmerized by my own dour human prayer cliché. I suffer the poet, I celebrate a poeta. I am a disillusioned myth maker, mining garbage along the pavement while remembering, backlot mornings, dumpster diving that disgusts me that won't wash off, just builds on the wet grease of my skin to never let go. With no closet to hang this coat of personal history, I ask, will America take care of me, take care of us? That care for the other's despair, that worry if you've eaten, even through their swelling diabetic feet, the overgrown diseased balls of flesh that push and push like from Charlie's neck, like they were reaching out to speak his truth through him, our truth. America, are you listening? You are the false, the myth propagator. You are the advertisement of fear, the billboard that lights my room, hoping me dead because of this poverty, hoping you were dead under this bright boulevard to reveal the stone hatred of your heart. Winter's coming. It will be under the shading trees you sleep, under the overhanging awnings where you crouch, in the deep recessed doorways of street side buildings. They're all like bedroom windows you cannot close, so your skin thickens from exposure to the open cold. America, will you take care of us? Provide a shelter. Take us into your arms, not into a county bed. I cannot afford you with my labor, unless with my death. I was born to you a taxable event, and die less human, merely as debt to be reclaimed. Winters come with a hot plate, junk for coal, for limp struggling thin veins that go too cold too quick. Solitude, set the table for none and none eat, and sunken cheek, the place where the light went out. Strangers, more alike than you and I, my sweet America, north land of borders and prisons and of collateral damage as we've become. That from our graves, soon, you will be made new again. That was beautiful. Joseph, was that the or I don't want to cut you off too soon. Was that the end? Very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was really beautiful to listen to that um, ambient sound in the background while you were speaking. Um, I'm excited to hear more about that piece that we were looking at. Um, really curious about it, but I'll, I don't want to just start talking too much. So Christine, I'd love to invite you to respond first in this one. Joseph, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing all of that. It, it was a, a real, um, it was a really special experience um, getting to look at the work and have you narrate in this, um, you know, in this kind of poetic narrative that you gave. Um, it really, it's, it was interesting because it felt like it really fit with the works um, while at the same time showing things that weren't necessarily there. So um, for example, well, all of these spaces um, that you initially showed in Hollywood, I used to live in LA and I know, I know a lot of these spaces and it was really interesting to see your perspective of these spaces. You know, um, you're occupying these places um, while they're empty at these hours that, you know, no one's there. Um, and these are busy spaces that are normally, you know, really occupied with a lot of sound and a lot of people. So it was a, a unique thing to see um, these places in that way. Um, but then also hear, you know, your, your voice. So as you, um, as your work progressed and you're talking about, you know, these um, obtaining, you know, human essential needs and your, um, you're not showing the presence of those needs or the absence of those needs, 
And yet hearing about them while I'm looking at the work, it all comes together in, in some great way. Um, so there's, there's something really, I think, special happening about this um, joining together of language and image um, that I'm, I'm really appreciating. Um, it, it seems to kind of evoke you know, that you're being in that space, you're talking about the, you know, the struggles and the, the things that are lacking or, um, but it, it becomes a, a kind of portrait of, of being and being in that city, being in that space. Um, and moving on to your video, you know, uh, again, I, I was struck by sound in this case, you know, this kind of cacophony of urban sound and busyness um, paired with, something that was soft and tactile and um uh you know you see the bare mattress and you see this uh evidence of touch um which is at contrast in contrast with with the sound and yet again it's um it's really coming together in a beautiful way um i'm curious i'd like to hear you speak a little bit more about that last piece in you know, these ideas you're bringing up about um, political issues in the US and, and how you're kind of um, navigating that with this kind of image of home and image of uh, kind of an intimate setting and, and, and how you're kind of working through those ideas. And I think you've just said it there. Um, I'm working through these ideas because of the way that I work generally. It's, it's, it's definitely generative and it's very instinctual. So it becomes a little bit difficult to, to understand um, outside of these markers that really uh, uh, place uh, my story in certain periods of time, but that can also, uh, can also go through more than just that one moment. So it speaks to more than just a moment, more than just my story, I think. I think it's in a certain respect, like an indictment, right? Um, so hopefully hereafter, I'll be able to better understand what it is that this project really is trying to say beyond what my poem is, uh, beyond the background noise that, that I kind of grew up with. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers that in, <laughs> that's not the best, but. No, that's great. Thank you. It, it, it really was a pleasure seeing all of that and hear you talk about it. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing how you continue to work through those ideas. It's really that's great. Cool. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like Christine, I, I was really moved by the combination of image and text. And quite frankly, I would rather listen to you read poetry than listen to myself talk right now. But um, it was really mesmerizing and lyrical and moving. And I particularly loved seeing the early, the black and white photographs in a way, because at first I was just happy to see someone working in black and white photography in that way. But it reminded me of Roy de Carava and Robert Frank. And there just has a kind of nostalgia, but that also felt very contemporary. And, um, you know, Los Angeles is notoriously the most difficult city to photograph. I mean, so many photographers have found it a challenging place to work. Um, and so I love seeing your, your take on, on this place. Um, and like Christine, I was also really interested. I had, I had a lot of questions as you talk. Um, and so I, I guess my, my comment question is two part. One is, um, I would just say from a practical perspective, just yeah. going out into the world, giving your viewer a little more information would be super helpful because I think I may be just really concrete, but I wanted to listen to you talking, but I was also like, what is that? What am I looking at? And I really wanted just a little information about it so that I could focus more on what you were saying. So I would just say, because you won't always be there with the work to explain it as it goes out into the world, to think about that as you, you know, whether you just choose to put titles on the slides or mediums, um, also because you're looking at a small screen. So that's just a very practical, piece of advice, but it's something worth thinking about. But I would love, could you talk about what that object was and how it, you would display it in the space? Like, would it be seen as a video or is it a sculpture with a 
sound projection, how, how would you show that work? I would bring that into the space to recreate uh, what I think uh, developed my sense of what reality was and how I experienced it. And so um, as kind of like in what I'd read, it, it is one of, again, like one of the markers, I think that really sort of holds together and encompasses a lot of what I do. Um, so it would get essentially laid out on the ground with a series of uh, covers, which was kind of how we sort of lived for, for a certain period. Um, that um, uh, followed by that ambient uh, poetry and the urban uh, sound. Um, I think that would speak most powerfully than to than to play it in a respect of like additive. Let me just add this and this and this, which I can say, you know, these were the things that influenced uh, who I am. Uh, so I really did want to just get a very simple, impactful situation visually and audio. Yeah. I love the moment at the end where the background noise cuts out and it's just your voice. I thought that that was so beautiful. Um, and so I like the idea of markers. That's an interesting, I mean, it's a really interesting concept as a kind of progression, especially how you talked about your work. Um, as a sort of progression, both of aesthetically and formally, but also of your own experiences. Interesting. I mean, I really loved it. Um, but I, you know, I just was having questions like, how big is that thing? What's that made out of? I really wanted to, I really had a lot of questions. So I just would consider, you know, if you're applying for grants or MFA programs or whatever it is to make sure you give the viewer that piece of information so that they're not distracted while they're listening to your beautiful poem and your voice, which was really the highlight of the work. Uh, thank you so much, Corey. Yeah, the, I, that was, um, I second that. And it was also really, um, you know, I, I kept thinking, Joseph, about the way that you move between media and felt to me that you gravitate towards photography when you want to conceal something. You know, I think there was a lot in the work when you were really explicit was through language, through those objects and the paintings, they felt really close to touch and embodied. And then the photographs felt very disembodied, of course, because you have the, the shoes and all those empty spaces. But it was interesting. I felt I wrote down in my notes like photography to conceal, not to reveal. And I think that was a really poetic turn in the work. And I wonder if that's um, something that you think about or have thought about as you move between or, or decide, you know, how a piece will come to life. Um, I have had, and it took a moment to understand that the photographs, my photography, attempts to, to show from where I was to where I am. And where I am is very much in terms of photography, um, distant from, mm -hmm. from that life, from those experiences. And so you do get that sort of, uh, like you said, that sort of distance, you know? So it is in part to conceal, but also in the same, uh, like for example, the series of, uh, that I used the shoes with, that was a subject matter that dealt with uh, self-portraiture. Um, so again, I think that speaks to what you had just mentioned for sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. It was a really, I think that was a really poetic turn um, in the work. And I, I think it's something to keep considering kind of kept me on my toes um, when I was watching the presentation. Um, I don't know, Corey, did you have what kind of- yeah, I just, I just was thinking thought? about the, the why I was thinking about Roy de Carava in relationship to those pictures. And it's not just because of the darkness, but I think of the, the, um, almost physicality of the darkness in the pictures, that it's not an empty space, that it's an active presence and that that the darkness is, is, a, is an actor in the scene in a way. And that I thought that that was very powerful in the way that played off the, the shoes, which are also a symbol of both presence and absence. And um, I think that, you know, aesthetically they have something in common with Dikarava, but that was also something that Dikarava was very interested in was, you know, 
the powerful of blackness as a physical presence. So I thought that was really interesting. I also mm-hmm. thought of Anna Mendieta's work in certain mm-hmm. ways when the shoes started popping in, you know, that I started thinking about the, the presence and absence of the body in the landscape was interesting. So you know, yeah, there absolutely. was a lot to think about. I know. And I was thinking about that Francis Elise piece with the shoe shiners. So like, that's a, I don't know if you've seen that piece, yeah. Joseph. Um, yeah. With the sound that, that has such an all kind of a transportive piece as well. Um, that definitely came to mind and William Camargo's photography as well. Um, anyway, great job. That was so, uh, so enjoyable. It was really a pleasure to experience that presentation. Thank you so much. For sure. Thank you. Thank you all for, especially Corey, Christine, and of course, Aspen for comments, questions, and all that fun stuff for sure. Awesome. Okay, Stephanie, you ready to um, roll it out 2.0? Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so it should work this time. So <clears throat> one moment. Okay, so please let me know if this works. Heck, we're still seeing the those boxes. Why, why, Zoom? I know, this is weird, okay. Oh, um, is any, it, I, we'll just crowdsource this. Any Zoom wizards in this audience tonight that have had an experience with this and might know? It might be experience? her notes, if you have notes on top of your presentation. No, okay, or another one, okay, sorry. I think um, I'm probably just gonna share it it's it works it works like this oh yeah it's whenever whenever it goes to that we see these kind of like grayed out uh boxes Um, in there as a suggestion stephanie do you have this as a google slide yeah can you share it with me and i'll actually share my screen so send me your google slide i'll share your screen and then you can just talk through it um I think those might be text boxes that are blank in the slide presentation. So Uh photos were put on top of um, just blank text boxes. And so they're showing up somehow um, just as those. Everyone in the audience, you're getting this great snapshot of what Zoom teaching was like last year. It's just like, who's in the room? How can we figure this out? Bear with us, one and all. It's so funny. We did a tech check beforehand, and that, that those boxes were definitely not showing up. So I'm not mm-hmm. sure what. Stephanie, okay. one last thing to try, which the audio for the video might be a little bit off, but as you're sharing your screen, if you uncheck that box, optimize for video, let's see if that fixes. Um, optimize. Oh, so click off that, right? Yeah. How's this? I'm sharing my screen right now. Yeah. Is it really we're in. We're in. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm okay. I think um, good can now. I see if mine works real quick? Sorry. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I just want to see if it works real quick. Yeah. Um, A beautiful spirit of cooperation from all the you... CCA faculty. No, I think it's, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's so weird. Yeah, it was just working. That's, I don't understand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll share your screen, Stephanie, and just let me know when I need to advance, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right. Bravo. Stephanie, you're doing great. This is, you're rolling with it. And uh, yeah. I'll speak from my own experience. Every art converse, you know, every artist talk, there's always something that goes down. So yeah, you're doing absolutely. Great. I, I told the students in my class that a very famous professor who shall go unnamed at this point showed up at a very important conference without her carousel of slides at the time when we used physical slides and it was an art history lecture and had to give the entire art history lecture with no pictures. So I could like, (laughs) it happens to everybody, even when you're not on computers. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. Um, So yeah, uh, like I was saying before, I'm Stephanie Hall. but I like I introduced myself as Stephanie Dolores Rose. Um, Dolores Rose is my middle name, um, and my major is photography. Um, yeah, I can go next. Okay. Um, you have to yeah. probably press it again. Yeah. Um, so 
So yeah, I am from Modesto, California area. Um, I grew up all around Modesto um, and now I'm currently based in Oakland. Um, what got me into photography? Um, I don't know, I feel like I've, I've always been really interested in old photographs and I have memories of, um, you know, looking through my parents like old boxes and just looking at photos of them and like just like old um, photos from like of my Nana from like the 50s and all of that. And I always was really interested in it. Um, so that's like pretty much how I what got an interest in getting going to school for photography. Um, I started at Modesto Junior College um, and that's when I bought my first Holga. Um, Holga is a toy camera, which I, I primarily take photos with. Um, I took like a five year hiatus or kind of just thought maybe I didn't need a degree or something. I just was kind of like, I'm just gonna do photography. And I started taking photos for my friend's bands and uh, I did like, I worked for Life Touch. I don't know if you guys know Life Touch, like school photography. Um, and that really helped me with like commercial, um, doing a lot of like, if I ever have to do a headshot, I can pose anyone without touching them. And I feel like that's like a really good um, technical um, feature to have in photography. Um, and after a while, um, I kind of just thought to myself, like, what am I doing? Um, just staying in Modesto, still living um, with my parents and stuff and just kind of realized like I need to get out of here. So I moved to the, the Bay Area in 2017 and started um, classes at San Francisco Art Institute, um, which was a really big thing for me, um, just like going to a big school like that. Um, and also coming from a place where I'm not from a rich family at all. Um, so I knew I was getting myself into like something really, really serious. Um, but then I, I went there until the pandemic hit um, in um, spring of 2020, I believe. Um, yeah, and it's because we, we all thought the school was going to be gone, <laughs> but obviously it's not. Um, I'm interested in um, the spiritual, the occult, metaphysical ideas of life. Um, I feel like that really affects like my photography. Um, I'm very attracted to the mountains. So a lot of my, a lot of my photography is landscapes and um, I do take photos of people, but I, I don't know. I'm feel really attracted of like my surroundings, um, and um, yeah, I guess I've always been really imaginative, and um, I have really vivid memories of like everything of my childhood and all of that. You um, can go to the next one. Sorry. Um, yeah. So my influences and inspirations. Um, so I. This one, like this section, I like it took a lot of self-reflection for me to realize, uh, think about what really influenced me throughout my art career. Um, when I, um, Bruce Connor and Francesca Woodman have both, um, I feel like in two parts of like my art school time, I had like these epiphanies or I like, I like want to call it. With Bruce Connor, um, when I was first attending um, MJC, um, the junior college, um, I saw the, his work and I realized like, I want to be experimental. Like, I didn't really know what kind of photography I was gonna do. And I was actually kind of like intimidated because learning about aperture and learning about all that stuff was really scary at first. And like, and I was like, what, like, do I really wanna do this? Like, um, but then once I discovered Bruce Connor, um, I realized I was like, oh my God, like this actually makes me really excited and being in the dark room and, uh, combining negatives, like that's something I used to do a lot in, in the dark room. Um, and then um, as I was going through um, SFAI, um, I kind of, I feel like I was being flooded too much with all these artists and stuff where I, I feel like I, I wasn't inspired by anyone like completely until I um, discovered Francesca Woodman. Um, it was more about her aesthetic um, that I was really um, like, attracted to um just like um just putting herself in these like abandoned buildings and kind of making you feel a little uncomfortable but interested and you just want to keep looking and you just want to like I don't know just creating this whole different idea of like um like space and I don't know feeling emotion um, is what I was really 
interested in. Um, and then next. <laughs> Um, so this is um, my, my best friend and main supporter in photography and filmmaking is my friend, Sonny Frisco. Um, he inspires me to branch out. He's actually one of the ones that convinced me to go to art school. Um, he's actually one of the main people who actually got me into filmmaking as well. Um, and yeah, he's definitely someone I can collaborate with, I can learn from. I feel like we could, um, you know, do more of like actually big projects together. Like there's not many people I feel like I can like um, bounce ideas off of and have them like understand completely and be like, yes, like let's do that. And Sunny was one of them. Um, and this is um, a music video he, that he created with one of our friends band in Modesto. Um, we don't have to play it right now, but um, yeah, next. Um, and um, so what influenced me the most, I would say, is my childhood memories in my hometown. Um, I feel like it took a lot of stuff for granted living out there. Um, I've always wanted to um, escape and get away from it, but um, I feel like I was, I don't know, really happy in like my, my fantasy world out there. Like, and I feel like um, using the Holga really, in, it reminds me of that time. It reminds me of being in this dream world and creating like this, um, I don't know, just like dreamscape, I guess. Um, and then, and also, I think it also really reflects the music I listen to. Um, I have like memories of being with my dad and, um, listening to like his like new wave eighties music and classic rock and, I feel like that, like, um, just like even the music, uh, the, the shows that I used to watch um, really affects like the way that I, I, I think about art and, and the way that I want to like make art. Um, sorry, yeah, that's, that's it for that slide. <laughs> and so this is my art. Um, I wanted to start off with when I first came out here um, to SFAI, um, this is this one's called Belena. I used I moved out to Alameda first. Um, at first, um, when I was out here, I didn't really have a direction. I want to say like a concept. Um, I felt like I was mostly just taking photos of my everyday life, and um, I felt like I was kind of in like this culture shock um, living out here, and just like everything was new and exciting. So um, I have a lot of photos of me um, walking around and I'm also a dog walker too. So that kind of um, plays a part in it too. So I have a lot of photos of just like, like a boat in the, man in the random of a parking lot. And um, yeah, and this is like pretty much what I was doing when I first started um, art school. Um, you can go on to the next one. Um, so this one, this is kind of like the, one of the first projects that I actually felt like I could, like I wanted to, I guess, portray a feeling. Um, and this one's called Easy to Know and Easy to Forget. Um, it's from a song that I randomly discovered when I was going through a time of being taken advantage of by certain people. Um, romantic and friendships were just not stable. Um, and I was taking these photos in Golden Gate, Golden Gate Park when I was dog walking and doing a lot of um, double exposures. Um, and this is one that like during that time that like when I was looking at him, I was like, wow, like this is how I feel. Like I'm easy to know and easy to forget. You know, like, I don't know. It's, um, that's it. And then for the next. So, um, oh. I think you have to go back one. And I'll probably go a little bit faster because I think I'm taking a minute. Um, so I got I did get into filmmaking. Um aside from I guess the material, um, I have like spiritual memories um that have never left me when I was very young. Um, I got really into like meditation when I was 17, and I feel like this veal like lifted from me, like this kind of um, 
spiritual awakening, I guess, <laughs> um, which kind of um, sparked this idea for the, the mask, this mask idea. Um, it's kind of about the invisible mask that we wear. Um, and I um, have these people wearing, have no eye holes or anything. So the, the mask is pretty much basically about, um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. The mask is, uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> It's just, um, it's pretty much portraying like the mask in a physical form because we're, um, we're unaware of the masks that we wear and we, we create these masks over, like with our everyday life, um, through everyday like um, relationships and for like protection. So I created these films of like these people doing um, just normal activities. Um, and yeah, and this this film in particular, I did the soundscape and did the um, the lighting um, and all that. And my friend Joey, um, he's really good at music, so he was able to um, play music blindfolded, which is what this film is about and about um, someone getting lost in the moment. Um, yeah. And then next one. This is a film. I don't think we have time. <laughs> um, and then here is my dreamscape photo book. Um, it's just a photo book of eight and a half by 11, 20 pages, black and white film with all with Holga. Um, I have poetry in it as well. Um, I wanted to make it as like a monologue um, as you're, you know, when you're dreaming, you have an inner monologue and it doesn't really make sense. So I have this um, dreamscape where um, you're walking through the forest and having this inner inner monologue. Um, yeah. And this is um, the first page. And then there's a second page as well. Oh, oh it's glitching, sorry. Um, okay, so this is my senior thesis. This is called Until Then. Um, oh. Um, yeah, so these ones are taken in during the pandemic when I felt the most loneliest I've ever felt in my life, I felt like. <laughs> but it was a weird kind of loneliness where um, like I didn't wanna be around people, but I, I did. Like I, I had this uh, sense of like really wanting to um, have human interaction, but having anxiety whenever I was around it, whenever I did get it. Um, so this is... Uh, um, from photos that kind of are portraying that. Um, I'm going to next one. Sorry, it's kind of glitching. And this one is in progress. This is something I, I, I do want to do another dreamscape and doesn't have a title yet. And this is just one of the photos from it. Um, so I'm, I am going to have this at my senior show. Um, it's going to be like four to five photos. Um, and I'm going to have poetry again. Um, and right now I'm, I'm working on the poetry. If, the poetry is, is kind of like right as you go um, kind of thing. So I'm taking my time trying to process like um, everything. Um, so again, and then the next one. And this is my plans after graduation is um, definitely number one is to finish projects. <laughs> I have like a lot that I've started and just didn't finish. Um, next is definitely to travel. Um, there's so many things I haven't seen before. Um, I want to create new films. Um, I want to do more with the mask. Um, maybe do more like photo shoots instead of films. Um, and maybe also maybe do an inner monologue with it instead of having them be, um, having no voice, I guess. And then another thing I've, I've, I didn't know I was going to be really into is editorial work. Um, I have a lot of friends that, um, like my friend Kazaya, she um, asked me to take photos for her, for her um, architectural um, profile. And um, and also did one on my friend Gianni um, on being um, a single father during the pandemic. And that's a photo of his son. Um, and I, I wanna do more um, stories like that. And also I would like to do more promotions for like other artists as well. Um, yeah, so yeah. And, um, you go to the next one, I guess. And then this is just uh, all my stuff. And yeah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks.
Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, sorry, I like don't do public speaking very much, so I'm like. Hmm. Don't worry, the best way is just to get more, you know, we all get better by doing it and by practicing. And, you know, you had to really roll with it there. So even the, the, the best of us who come, you know, you come prepared and then something changes at the end and it's it's easy to get thrown off, but you did a really nice job. Thanks for sharing your work with us. And just for your, you know, vulnerability and for being so candid about your experiences. I think when you said, when you said about being so lonely, the loneliest you'd ever felt, it felt like probably everyone in here could really identify with that. Uh, that looked like something different for all of us, but um, I really appreciated you sharing that. Um, so uh, Corey, we're on you for first response, I think, take it away. Um, Stephanie, really nice job, but you really were <laughs> a trooper. Um, and I had no, you didn't tell me the part about the dog walking. So now I'm envisioning, like I have a whole different picture of you while you're shooting and dog walking at the same, it's actually reminds me a little bit of Vivian Mayer with her. Um, she was a nanny and a photographer at the same time, but um, <laughs> That's a, a wonderful way to see the world around you. I am sorry that we didn't get to see your film because um, for those, the rest of you, you should ask Stephanie to show it to you because the film of her friend in the mask lighting a fire is one of the most surreal um, films I've seen. It's mesmerizing. And I'm really interested in the way your film work and your photography work addresses this sort of dream state, but in very different ways. And actually it's funny because it's almost like two different artists sometimes. And I wonder, um, you know, the sort of photographs are these very dreamy um, sort of fantasy world. And then the, um, the films are kind of dream states in the sense that they're, they're completely surreal and strange and familiar at the same time. And I wonder if you feel a pull more strongly towards one or the other in your work. I don't know. I'm, it's more of like, you know, honestly, I feel like it's more of like, just like any, like a feeling like when I'm like going out and like shooting photography and I don't know. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> and then, I, I, and then I, like, a, I don't know, like, I feel like I'm, whenever I'm doing, like, my, like, whole good photography, like, I don't really, like, um, have, like, an, an idea of what I'm going to be taking a photo of, and, you know, like, I just have a feeling where I'm, like, I feel like going to Tilden today, or I feel like, and, like, and also, and, like, that's the thing is, I, I've been dog walking, I took a break from it, and I've been doing it again, and I, when I'm walking around, and there's certain things of seeing, like, certain neighborhoods and certain um just when I'm waiting for a dog to do something just looking up I like want to take a photo of like an angle or something or something like there's because sometimes it just makes me think back to something or makes me um reminds me of something and or like gives me like this like um like little tingle and I'm like oh like that makes me feel something I don't know what it is but I like it you know mm -hmm. um yeah and then with the with the films it's it's more of like I don't know. I feel like with the films and I don't know. I feel like it's more of me like trying to learn more about filmmaking, but also like still trying to like um give like someone like um I don't know, like a story or like a or like give them like, a feeling of being like, I know what what this is. Like, you know, I've I've felt this way before. If I've I wear that mask, like I'm wearing that mask now, you know. Uh, I don't know. And I don't know. It, it, I mean, I think it's at this point in your career, it's perfectly <laughs> fine to be exploring multiple avenues. I, yeah. I just think it's interesting because I love the sort of intuitive receptiveness to the world that you describe in one body of work. And then the the filmmaking is so deliberate and, and um, precise and planned in advance and very different, but they kind of explore similar themes. So I, I was just interested in yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, definitely do have different approaches to them. Like with the films, I, I feel like I do have to plan them out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I mean, with the films, actually, like, with the with my friend with the uh, the fire, and even with my friend with the, with the music, I'm pretty much like collaborating with them. Like, I brought over my mask, and I was like, "So, what do you want to do?" And he's like, "I don't know. It's your film." I'm like, "Well, want to light a fire?" He's like, "Okay." I'm like, <laughs> it was pretty much 
how, how that happened. You know? Yeah. Huh? There's something really primordial about that act of making a fire. Um, and with the mask, there's, I mean, I think I would think carefully about the sort of actions that the people perform if you go forward with oh, that, yeah. because I think that there's, that's part of it. It's just that sort of. Yeah, basic. yeah, I definitely do keep that in mind. Um, they because they're blindfolded, so they can't really like walk around or really do that much. So I do have to like pick an activity that is easy for them and something that they're comfortable with. Um, and also just because if it's especially when it's their idea, I'm like, hey, can you do that? And then also when it's so like mundane and so like just everyday thing, that that's what like makes me feel like um executes the mask idea more, you know. So no. Thank you. Stephanie, that was really great. Congratulations. I, I really hope you can let go of those really minor hiccups because what came through was your work and you know, we're not going to remember any of that other stuff. So I hope you can let it go. But um, yeah, it was great. One thing that came up for me a few times that I thought was so interesting was you mentioned several times about um, having really vivid memories. And I, I loved thinking about that with you as a photographer, because, you know, there's kind of this anecdotal adage of like photography, you know, as a means of preserving and of capturing things that you would otherwise forget. And you're using photography in this totally different way because you already have your memories stored in some great archive in your brain. So you don't need it that way. So I loved that. And to me, you know, when I was looking at these um, images of double exposures and images, you know, even with the fog kind of um, providing that kind of different exposure feeling in Golden Gate Park. And um, it's like you're, you know, you're documenting these kind of emotions that you were saying, you know, where you're opening up about loneliness and, and um, these kinds of raw emotions. And so it's like, um, it is, it is in a way, this kind of capturing of a memory of an emotion, which I thought really came through and I, I really appreciated. And, you know, a little bit came up about um, like a surreal quality or an interest in kind of the surreal. And I was, and the occult, and I was thinking back, you know, to um, kind of early surrealism, like the surrealist circle with Andre Breton and the kind of seances. And, and I was kind of thinking of this kind of magic making and, and how you were kind of conjuring up some of these things. And, um, but also, you know, the, the photography of Lee Miller and Man Ray and, and, and creating your own kind of, um, you know, producing this kind of moment of surrealism, you know, in, in your images. Um, I wish I could have seen the film and, but, you know, it's funny, even in that still, um, that mask, you know, is so striking. It's, it's really, yeah, I really want to see more and know more. Um, and I don't know if this is helpful, but it, it, it made me think of some of these um, artists like uh, Truly Hall, uh, an LA artist, you know, this, this really, this masking, this, these costumes and kind of creating this, this new, um, I don't know, a, a different reality um, with photography, with video, with um, disguise and production. I, I really liked that a lot. Um, one question for you, I, I think I have lots of questions, but let me, let me think, um, you know, like Aspen said, you know, when you mentioned that that was, that was the loneliest time, you know, that really did, that was a really, um, gave big feelings, you know, and, and I was curious, you know, when you said that those images were, you know, to portray that, to portray, um, the loneliness and the kind of disparity between wanting and not wanting human interaction and the anxiety that would come forth with human interaction, which I think we all, you know, have experienced in different level, at different levels and different ways through the pandemic. And you said, um, you know, that you were wanting to portray that. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that, you know, those images and, and how, and what you were showing and how you connected that to those feelings. Um, 
Yeah, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot, actually, just because I've noticed, like I've been doing um, my own archival project where I've like been seeing how, um, how I've been looking at things in, in the past and then also thinking about um, what I was going through at that time. And I've noticed that every single, like, I guess like phase or moments, um, I take photos differently and I, I view things differently. And I've noticed that through the pandemic, I was looking up a lot and looking at the top of things a lot and like looking at the edges of like, I don't know, like looking at just the top of things, I don't know. Um, like that's like, um, I feel like that's, that's like how, um, I think that's how, like how I've been approaching like this like project. Um, and I feel like that's how I'm able to portray this feeling because in that moment I had that feeling at that time, you know, and feeling that at, at that moment. And like, so taking that photo at that time, like, I don't, I don't know, like that's that's what's something that's it's hard for me to like explain because it's it's all a feeling, you know, it's all like an emotion and it's something that I haven't put into words yet. And it's like um this whole presentation has been making me like reflect on that and reflecting on like um like how do I do that and like like um like why, you know? Um so like yeah, and I feel like that really like I noticed like that happens. Like I've I've been taking photos like a certain way and 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 taking them with a certain camera. Like when I have two holgas, so when I go out, I like I know what what my my photos are gonna look like. And that one has and that particular camera is supposed to be a fisheye camera, but when I take off the fisheye, it creates like this weird vignette that like makes you feel like you're going into like a little wormhole kind of you know. And so that's why like um, I just like. I just know what, what my photos are going to look like. And I just, I don't know what I'm going to take a photo of, but um, it's more of like when I see them afterwards, like after I, I process them and everything, that's when I start having this like feeling where I'm like, I remember that. And I felt like this, you know? Um, yeah, I think, I think I explained that <laughs> as best as I could. <laughs> you did. And if I could just say quickly, I really think that, you know, you're mentioning when you're in the situation wanting or noticing that you're looking up or looking to the edges, I think, you know, as you work through it, you'll figure that out, but it, it is really telling, I think, because it, it does speak to removing yourself, you know, from where you are and what's in your immediate kind of surroundings to something that's outside of it. And, you know, I think that can be open to your interpretations, but I, I think that's, that's definitely moving into to really articulating what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Well, I just want to um, jump in here. Also, Stephanie, there seems there's a lot of interest in the chat. If it is, are there your films on your website? So I do have interact? the fire one. I have the fire one on YouTube, um, and I I don't have it on my website yet because I need to update that. Um, but the other one, the soundscape, I have not shown that one yet. Um, I don't know why I haven't. I just haven't. Um, <laughs> Shown it yet, but I'm really proud of it. And that's why I wanted to have it in this. But I can put the other one in the in the chat if you guys. Yeah, want. I think go go ahead while we um wrap up. I just want to um thank you again, Stephanie, for sharing your work and Joseph and Ben. It was just such a delight to learn more about what you're doing and and just to celebrate all your hard work. And I want to thank Corey and Christine. You were both wonderful. It was great to have your perspectives here. Thank you for the generous feedback and the references and just for really connecting with our students. Um, it's really awesome. It's such a great thing for a program that you're both willing to participate. So uh, I hope you all feel really proud of yourselves and all of your accomplishments because we certainly do. And um, I wanna thank all of you, everyone for joining us tonight. And um, if you wanna all kind of come, if, you, if you're willing and able to come back on screen and unmute yourself, and I'd love to invite you to uh, join me in a round of applause for our seniors. Soft clapping, I hear some. Ah, nice to see everybody. <laughs> Congrats, everybody. And Stephanie, you never have to really find the concrete answer of what you're doing. That's the whole reason why we're artists. Listen, tell her <laughs> that, it's <a> secret. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. It's always changing. Congrats. Also, oh, great, thank you. Everyone, if you're interested in seeing some of, um, 
in the film that we're just speaking about that that link is in the chat so grab that before you go but thank you one and all thank you it's so nice to see all of you here tonight yeah bravo all right everybody take care